This video is going to be part of a series of previews that I do for the Ravens-Texans AFC Divisional Round matchup Saturday afternoon in Baltimore. I'm not going to assume for this video that the Texans are going to stop or even slow down or totally eliminate the Ravens' run game, but what I will do in this video is offer to you if the Texans are able to put the Ravens in third and long situations or, or third and six slow down the running game such that they put the Ravens in in known passing play moments. Then I'll use some film against the Browns from some 2023 film overall from the Texans and from these two teams' week one matchup to illustrate how important those situations will be. Again, this is contingent upon the Texans stopping or slowing down the Ravens' run game, putting them in situations where the, the pass is a known element and they're able to bring different types of pressure, try to force Lamar to get the football out of his hands, or maybe they choose to go the four-man rush route, which is what they did last week against the Browns often. Uh, the impact that Lamar Jackson has is obvious on the pass rush and on the coverage element. The decisions that a defensive coordinator, or in this case head coach who calls the defense plays to make Ryan's, the decisions that they have to make on a on a play-by-play -play basis are different than last week against Joe Flacco or the week before that against Gardner Minshew and the Colts. Uh, back in week one, I thought the Texans' pass rush choices, however many players they decided to bring on each snap, from where, what position, all of those decisions I thought were made because they were acutely aware of Lamar's ability to scramble. And in a lot of situations, they were effective calls, the late blitzes by Jalen Petre. Uh, some of the pass rush wins, clean wins, off the edge against our offensive tackles. Moving forward to where we are now or leading up to Saturday's game, the situation is totally different from the standpoint of what the Ravens are able to do in pass pro and the, the effectiveness, the dangerous level of covering our, our wide receivers and tight ends in a man-to-man -man situation. After we've gone 13-4, and four, the, the dynamic is drastically different. And, the, and therefore, the answers to the questions from a Texan's perspective may be drastically different as well. And in the end, Lamar might just be too good at the pass-slash-scramble options in the moment unless you're going to bring five or six consistently. And the Texans recently have not had to do that against most teams because they've got a legit and impressive pass rush group, in my opinion. They can bring heat from a four-man rush standpoint. Will Anderson, the rookie from Alabama, he's got seven sacks in the regular season. He also had one last week in the 45-14 win over the Browns. Jonathan Grenard, the fourth-year outside linebacker, D-end, led the team this year with 12 and a half sacks. And that didn't come out of nowhere, however. He had eight sacks two years ago in 2001, his second year out of Florida. I think he played at Louisville to start his college career. A Derek Barnett, a late signee to this Texans team, after he was released or let go by the Eagles, he's now produced three and a half sacks in his last five games. It's a talented group. And after getting after Joe Flacco last week, putting pressure on him, causing him to make mistakes, some may say, well, that's the formula you follow this week. It's a totally different dynamic, a totally different test when Lamar Jackson is out there on the field. Uh, but to be honest with you, the Texans' offensive line, when you go back and look at the film, they gave us problems in week one. I think we all remember that, to be honest with you. And over the course of the season, the Texans' pass rush has been effective. They finished with 46 sacks in the regular season. Adding Barnett was a really smart move. The front office nailed the draft, picking up C.J. Stroud and Will Anderson, among others. Adding a guy like Barnett late in the season gave them that fourth quality player to use out on the edge when in situations when Anderson or Grenard was hurt. Jerry Hughes, another experienced guy, played with Buffalo for a long time. He's now 35 years old, but he can still make plays. He's got three sacks this year after putting up nine in 2022. It's a really, really good group of DNs. I really shouldn't refer to them as outside linebackers. The Texans are a 4-3 base. Uh, Blake Cashman is a hybrid Inside linebacker who they walk up to play some OLB, meaning on the line of scrimmage, to go from a 4-3 to a 3-4 look, under front, whatever you want to call it. We're going to focus on some third down pass plays against the Browns and then look at some film from week one 
and also reflect on how well in certain situations the Ravens were able to protect Lamar Jackson, particularly in the last two regular season games in which he appeared against the 49ers and the Dolphins. We'll kick this film off, started talking about Will Anderson, Grenard, and Barnett. This first one is early fourth quarter, week one. It's a sack against Morgan Moses from the top side of the screen. You can see pre-snap that Will Anderson spot shadow, and then you get the end zone angle. He's an explosive athlete. You get a hold on Moses as well. Finished with seven sacks on the year. I feel like his impact was more than just seven sacks. To me, talent-wise, no question. It looks like he's going to be a guy who can get 12, 14, 15 sacks in a season just with the talent level, the, the burst, and the ability to close down. We'll let you see this one again from the end zone angle. This is Grenard off the other side. He's not the guy who spot shadowed. Just basically walking Ronnie Stanley back into the quarterback for a sack on the Ravens' first possession. That's been a problem for Ronnie Stanley in 2023. It appears as if he, he does not have the same weight, strength, and ability to anchor against some of these guys in these bull rush situations. Hopefully the, the rest has allowed him to get healthy and be a better version of himself because we're going to need it against Grenard, who generally is going to play on the Texans' right. The offense is left, so he'd line up against Stanley. Inside slant here versus the right tackle against the Broncos week 13. This is Anderson. His ability to close down, and I think his ability to play through contact is very notable. He's lined up as the outside D end here. Cashman has called a stunt for these two to execute, so you can see the shift occurs to get them lined up in a three and a five, and then post-snap, they're both going to stem down into the interior gap or the gap that's to their inside, their right, and Anderson's ability to play through contact He's a strong dude. He's got a strong frame and a great base, if you ask me, even though he's not a huge outside linebacker slash D end. I think he could have played in a 3-4 system, could have played in a 4-3 system. Wherever you put him, the dude can just ball out. Third and three against the Broncos. He's against the right tackle at the bottom side of the screen. Another four-man rush here. I think this – I'm going to mention this multiple times during the video. I think it's a big swing point in terms of whether the, t the Texans can get pressure with a four-man rush or not. I don't believe that you can play a four-man rush and go man-free against Lamar. I think you're wasting the 11th player. Four-man rush is more effective when you play zone against Lamar or quarter split field stuff, in my experience. I, I feel like a five-man rush, uh, excuse me, I feel like a five-man rush, a four-man rush with man-free might as well just be a five-man rush. You might as well just add it in there, number one. Number two, sometimes a five-man rush might as well just be a six-man rush. I don't know that there's really much in between when you're facing Lamar Jackson. But look, they've got the talent to do it with Grenard, Barnett, Anderson. Um, as I mentioned, those guys have put up you know great numbers this year. Grenard has 12 and a half sacks. Completely underrated dude. This is a third and six, week 13 against the Broncos. Grenard is down here. At the bottom of the side, Greenard, maybe I am mispronounced his name. Uh, forgive me for that. It's a mug look by the Texans. I actually really love the, the staggered dropping out of these guys. Anderson is the first guy, I think, to get pressure. But I love how first the DB to the top side of the screen drops out, then Cashman, who seems like a very versatile player, and then finally Harris down to the boundary drops out post-snap. So it's not like all three guys are dropping out at the same time. There's this staggering of their uh, of their dropping out from their mug look. Grenard, forgive me if I'm mispronouncing his name, ends up being second there behind Anderson to get the quarterback hit. A stunt underneath here against the Steelers uh, allows him to get a sack on Pickett. It's an organic four-man rush. Now, I'm not saying that necessarily they're going to be doing a whole lot of this. This may be a stunt that is not used a ton against Lamar. Having said that, it's one that's worked against us at times in 2023 and 2022. You see it's mirrored look, basically both D tackles going up the field and then the defensive ends outside linebackers stemming underneath in the case of the guy we're talking about, Grenard, stems underneath and when Pickett steps up, runs himself directly into a sack. The larger point here that I've mentioned at least twice already is that the four-man rushes, if they are able to get to Lamar and pressure him and get him off his spot, drop seven into coverage, be multiple in coverage. That's one-third 
of the things that I think their defense has got to check off in order to have a successful day. Grenard is also very good against the run. In doing a Dalvin Cook film, I ran across uh, some plays of him playing for the Jets this year against the Texans when the Texans completely obliterated the run game. This is a first and 10 where he's going to take on the left tackle, fold inside against Najee Harris, uh, get involved in the tackle. He's a very physical, underrated football player. I certainly don't want to see him play well against the Ravens, but like watching him play, I feel like he should get more credit and should get more recognition uh, for how great of a season he's had in 2023 because I think he's been playing with injuries here recently. Last play for Grenard, similar situation against the Jets week 14. As I mentioned, I went and grabbed some film of Dalvin Cook. In this case, he sheds the left tackle. There's also some contact by uh, another engagement happening, so it's not like he just threw the guy off of him, which is what it looks like. It's a devastating duo, if you ask me, on the edges. Two young guys, play hard, play fast. I think they represent the tip of the spear for this Texans defense. Cashman makes a lot of tackles. Derek Stingley, all-pro potential guy. I still think Jalen Petre is a really good football player. I know that other people are, are more down on him. Harris and Perryman are quality inside linebackers. Harris made the pick six last week on a, a critical fourth and two uh, where the Browns were trying to convert and get back in the game after the initial pick six. I, th I think these two are the tip of the spear because they play well against the run and they're able to attack the quarterback. Adding Barnett, who's now got three and a half sacks after being let go by the Eagles, was really cool to see. I'm certainly not rooting for him this week either, but I like it when veteran guys are able to squeeze out one more opportunity and then show what they are um, able to do. Grenard with the sack, excuse me, Will Anderson with the sack after Grenard gets the pressure against the Browns. And then a third down sack here for Barnett. He's off the right side. Clean win against the left tackle. Look, is the Ravens' offensive line better than the offensive line that we saw for the Browns last week? Yes, I do believe we will, that our offensive line is. They have a lot of problems in protection. Clearly, they've dealt with injuries. Uh, don't pretend to, to offer that that's not part of the reason that they had a lot of difficulty. Nonetheless, it's an element that I think we have to at least have to talk about and recognize that if the Texans are able to get a win, it's going to be because they were able to give the Ravens real problems in pass pro with minimal guys dedicated to that. Now, having said that, I think the Ravens' offensive line has been more consistent lately. I'm going to show some film against the Dolphins and the 49ers, and then we'll revert back to week one film. The entire flow of the play calling for Munkin has been much better when the Ravens' offensive line has been able to pass pro. This Texans defense looks like the type that maybe you want to throw on early downs. Now, I'm going to talk about turnovers, and granted, the Ravens did turn the football over twice last week against the Steelers, but of course, we know we had a lot of backups playing, number one. Number two, Lamar didn't play, and there are certain guys on the offensive line that didn't play either. Prior to that game against the Steelers, the Ravens had only turned the football over three times in their six-game win streak. And when I say six-game win streak, I mean the final four of which was against the Dolphins in reverse order, the Dolphins, 49ers, Jaguars, and Rams, teams that all entered each of those games with a winning record, if, you, if, you, if, if memory serves. Now, getting back to turnovers and talking about the offensive line and the pass game. Turnovers in the run game is always going to be the story at every level of football, right? But I think pass pro in this game has just as big an impact. And here's why. Two outcomes with the Ravens run game. Well, I guess three, but let's say the run, Ravens run the ball really well. What's going to set up the pass game? It's going to set up passing situations on early downs to really take advantage of a fast, aggressive Texans defense. Flip side of that, if the Ravens can't run the ball consistently, well, then now you've got one box checked out for the Texans. And the perceived edge for the Ravens, in my opinion, which is <clears throat> our wide receiver and tight end group against the Texans' DBs overall, kind of absolving Derek Stingley of that. He's an amazing football player. He's got great talent. I was glad to see him have a spectacular year this year. Uh, five interceptions. I think he only played 10 games, maybe 11, something like that. But since he's come back, Texans' defense, I think, is, has taken off. If the Ravens can't run the ball well, if the Texans are able to dictate to us when we're 
available to, when we're able to run the football and when we're not, we're going to have a hard time getting to the 20 first downs that we've basically averaged in our six game win streak. I'm, I'm absolving the Steelers situation here. 20 plus, at least 20 first downs in each of those six wins, also averaging 407 yards per game. A remarkable run by the offense. And I think the O line played a big role, even though, admittedly, Lamar had been sacked 13 times in that six-game streak, so just over two sacks per game. It's my opinion, and and perhaps you share the same opinion, and maybe you don't, that when Lamar Jackson has time to throw the football or or assess the field and find the right read or, or move out and scramble, if he chooses to, that he's damn near unstoppable. If you're in a four-man rush in that situation, Lamar will be able to scramble out of there and generate yards, keep drives going, or find the open player once he's on the move and he's figured out what the coverage is. Now, if you're rushing five or six, you can force him to get rid of the ball. The Texans did some of that in week one, and we'll show some film of that here in a moment. But you perhaps open yourself up to larger swaths of space that would allow the Ravens receivers and tight end group to, to make big plays, which they can. And they've done that in 2023, multiple guys. This is truly a spread offense. Multiple guys are able to make plays. And if you bring too many in coverage and play too much, man, Lamar and these guys can burn you. Here you see likely winning on a fourth and seven against the Dolphins. I'm not sure what choice the Texans will make. They were very multiple in week one. In my opinion, they showed a lot of different looks. D'Amico Ryan's a brilliant defensive mind. I'm sure he'll bring pressure at times in response to a situation where Lamar has escaped or scrambled, extended play to find someone or hurt them with his legs. Thereafter, you may get a response from D'Amico Ryan's and their defensive staff that you weren't getting up to that point because Lamar has impacted them. The pass rush has, in essence, failed to contain him. So how things work out in the first quarter, first quarter and a half impacts the calls the rest of the game. I will say this. They used Sticks Blitz Zero twice in that game in the first half, and I thought it had an impact. The reason why it's used so much, the reason why against Lamar, is because it removes his ability to scramble. You didn't see him use it last week against Joe Flacco because he's not mobile with this point. at this point. So the choices they make, I think, will probably be similar to week one. We have shown a lot more danger with our receivers over the course of the season. I don't think anyone, myself included, knew how good our passing game was going to end up being uh, late in the year, particularly during that six-game win streak. <clears throat> Getting back to some week one film, if we're able to to give Lamar time to find the open receiver, as you see just a little quick screen out here to Zay where he makes a couple people miss, then we're going to cause major, major problems for everyone, Texans, Chiefs, whoever. If we can give him time, he's going to find to make the right decision. It's just what he does. It's what he's always done, and he's doing a great job of it this year in particular but I think he's having more opportunities to do that. We've done a better job of using multiple concepts to keep defenses on their heels, let them attack less, because we haven't been in as many third and eights where the defense knows what's coming and they can just go stick split zero and force Lamar to throw the football. I think the Texans' run defense is spectacular. Do I think they'll be able to stop or slow down the Ravens' run game? I think they'll be able to slow it down at times. They're really good at it. I believe they were second in the NFL this year in yards per carry allowed at 3.5. Forget who was first. I don't think it was the 49ers. I think it was the Patriots, but I might be wrong. Can they make us totally one-dimensional over the course of a four-quarter game? No, I don't think so. I think there'll be moments where the run game pops off, whether that's Gus, Justice Hill, Lamar on a keep, Dalvin Cook if he plays, Melvin Gordon. Our job offensively will be such to create situations where we keep them from pressuring Lamar and we can generate consistent plays, basically offering a jab out there, a conservative jab, 
that puts D'Amico Ryans and those guys on the back foot, second and four as many times as possible, or maybe second and five, the Texans offense is going to score. Are they going to score 24 points? I mean, I, I can't say that, but they're they're playing really well. C.J. Stroud knows what he's doing. He makes quick reads. He gets through the read progression extremely fast. Last week against the Browns, really shredded uh, what did not look like to me a really prepared Browns defense. What's my point in mentioning this? I think we're going to need 20 points to win the football game. No turnovers either side. And I'm mentioning that because, look, the Texans have not turned the football over a whole lot this year. Other than back-to-back games in Week 10 and 11 against the Bengals and the Cardinals, turnovers has not been an issue for this Texans offense. It has for us at times, not during our six-game win streak, if we can keep the run game going, which I think is definitely a possibility, protect Lamar way better than we did in Week 1 because I thought that I thought the Texans were able to get pressure on Lamar. I thought they were able to impact his decision-making. We were not yet comfortable with who we were overall. I think we're a way different team, and they are too. You know, cre- Give those guys credit. I do think that matchup-wise we can attack them. We can attack their DBs. This is an example of stick split zero. Late timed blitz by Jalen Petre gets a pressure on Lamar. Jerry Hughes also, the veteran that I mentioned, is to Lamar's right. We get called for intentional grounding. I guess because the ball didn't reach the uh, line of scrimmage. We did have some situations where we were able to win in in man. We also drew, I think, three defensive pass interference penalties um, in this game. Here's one of them, OBJ against uh, Derek Stingley, who, like I said, has really had an all-pro caliber season. Didn't get that designation. I'm not here to say he should have or shouldn't have. I think he was capable of it. I think he played to that level. You guys let me know if you think the pass pro – is as important as I do in this game. If the run game is successful and we protect Lamar and we don't turn the football over, we win. That's simple. That's been the Ravens' M.O. this year. I don't see the Texans going out there and scoring 31, 35 points to outscore us if we don't turn the football over and we have the run game and the pass pro going because in pass post situations, I'm going to accept it as a given that Lamar will make the right decision and get the football to guys so that they can make plays. Let me know if you share my, number one, respect and admiration for the Texans' defense because I think they're very good at what they do. And I think D'Amico Ryans is a great teacher. I see evidence that he's a great teacher because these guys play multiple coverages and multiple looks, and they play fast. They do those things well. Having said that, I still do have confidence in what this offense can do, even against a defense like this one that I think is extremely capable, very fast and aggressive, exceptional against the run. Some thoughts. Throwing on early downs. Not necessarily having to be under center play action, which there's going to have to be a big conversation this week. Probably some other people have covered it already about how often the Texans are under center and how often they're in straight drop back mode under center versus play action. Our defense is going to be challenged in a way that's slightly different from things that we've dealt with in the past. I have all, I have had the opinion about Mike McDonald's defense in the past couple of years that if you're going to be an 11 personnel and you're going to be in the shotgun and you're going to drop back and throw the ball from that alignment 65, 68% of the time, something like that, then he's going to give you more problems than you will have answers for. But under center run game is different, particularly out of 11 personnel. I don't know that the Texans' run game is nearly as effective as the Rams, which caused us so much trouble. I do think it's going to be a part of their game plan to kind of shorten the game some and then use C.J. Stroud strategically, play action stuff, get the ball to Nico Collins. I thought they did an amazing job last week throwing the ball to the tight ends. Uh, Jordan and Schultz are both talented guys in somewhat different sense. Jordan's a really run after the catch guy. Uh, I kind of digress from the point of the video. I think the Ravens have the blueprint to deal with this Texans defense even though they're very fast and extremely well coached. Having said that, if the Texans can check off the first box, slow or stop the Ravens' run game, then they're well on their way to putting themselves in position to compete for four quarters and stay in the game, possibly force turnovers because they put us in a disadvantageous positions like third and eight or second and nine. Appreciate you guys' time, man. You let me know uh, what you think of the video, the concept, 
focusing on the pass pro for the Ravens? Do I think it's improved since week one? Absolutely. And since early in the season as well, after Ronnie Stanley and Tyler Linderbaum went down in week one, and I think missed the better part of the next three weeks. <clears throat> totally different offensive line group. As an aside, and I wanted to save this comment until near the end, I think it's brilliant when we rotate in tackles. Some would disagree, and that's no problem. The thing that I like about it is it gives the defensive coordinator and the defensive staff over there another thing to worry about, another layer to think about when they are calling their, their coverages and their, and their stunts. And, of course, we know that on-field checks are done by the defense, so a coordinator, in this case a head coach, may call a particular coverage and stunt. We line up in a different formation than he was expecting, and they may check out of that coverage and that stunt. That's why you see guys communicating pre-snap so much. So there is the coordinator's call into the defensive captain, and then there is the defensive captain and other people recognizing, oh, crap, we don't want to run this coverage and this stunt against that formation, and we check into something else, whatever they check into. When we are rotating tackles, I think it adds another layer for the defensive coordinator to worry about. Oh, that tackle is better in pass pro than the other tackle. That guy's a better run blocker than the, than the starting tackle. I think there's another layer, almost like we're substituting not just position players, which we are, tight ends, running backs, fullbacks, receivers, but also substituting tackles at the same time. I think there's a layer of gamesmanship, maybe, is the word. I'm sure there's probably a better word than that. But I'm interested in whether the Ravens do that this week or not to try to give even a half a second's pause to D'Amico Ryans, or at least a thought to consider what we might be doing with each tackle or set of tackles in the game. Let me know what you think of those thoughts and the other ones I brought up in this video. I have another preview out, hopefully Wednesday evening, and hopefully a surprise uh, visit for you guys uh, to another content creator's channel that I think you guys will enjoy. If you think other Ravens fans would enjoy this preview, this look at the Ravens hosting the Texans in the AFC Divisional Round matchup on Saturday, then please consider grabbing a link to this video, sharing it out on social media to let other Ravens fans enjoy it as well.